l'éducation du professeur Walton, euh, c'est critique sur la technique. Parce que je pense que la technique est plus en France que ce qu'on a ici au Canada, on dit plus la technologie. Mais, euh, donc pour lui, la, la, la technique, c'est plus un objet, c'est plus quelque chose que. C'est plus quelque chose qu'il faut... Euh, c'est vraiment un outil. Et, mais ce n'est pas le, le cœur comme tel. Euh, la façon que plusieurs personnes peuvent le voir, même moi en particulier. Euh, ce n'est pas l'objet de la recherche d'après lui, si je comprends bien. C'est plutôt juste un outil. Euh, si on va chercher un peu dans ce que les poètes disaient, c'est plus une extension sens d'une certaine façon. Euh, mais pour lui, c'est une extension des sens qui amène plus à des trucs comme la haine et la guerre. C'est quelque chose que j'ai beaucoup retenu. Euh, et non pas nécessairement ce qu'il disait autrefois, comme avec l'imprimerie, quelque chose qui amenait plus d'ouverture entre les peuples. Euh, je vais arrêter pour l'instant. Okay. So, um, I... Interpreted from the, the speech, um, his criticism of technology was that it was uh, it was not it was not an, an, an objective but a tool, and and it's not uh, really um, quite the way I see it. For me, it's uh, uh, I think it's more as a, as McLuhan would have seen it maybe as an extension of the senses. And, but he seems to say it leads more to, to hate and war. And whereas when there, before the technologies, there was printing or publishing, and that seemed to not have the same results. Just a little comment that I've taken the notes during the long of the presentation of Professor Volton in talking about communication and information. C'est sûrement quelque chose que Professeur Prou va parler ensuite. Euh, C'est qu'à un moment donné, j'ai été obligé de filtrer tout ce qui venait en anglais pour être capable de seulement me concentrer sur l'objet de la discussion et de, de ne pas écouter du tout ce que la traductrice disait parce que ça réinterprétait et ce n'était pas tout à fait ce que le Professeur Volton disait. Ah, C'est un mensonge, j'en suis sûr! <rire> So so when when I was listening to Professor Gordon, I was taking notes and um, I, I had to sort of filter out the the interpreter's uh, uh, English version because I I was I felt that she wasn't wasn't exactly what was being said in English. I just want to say something. I'm a neuropsychologist. I saw the opposite. I was amazed. I said, how the hell is she doing this? Right? I, said, oh, I was feeling good. Well, she was good. I was fine. I don't know. But what I find interesting is the distinction that Professor Breton has made between the community and the society. Quand le professeur Breton dit qu'avec euh, les, les techniques, la technologie, ça crée encore plus de communautés, euh, c'est vrai. Euh, les communautés qui existent d'une certaine façon, de façon virtuelle, mais en même temps, les sociétés, euh, les sociétés, c'est les gens, ce que le professeur Breton disait, avec qui on est forcé de vivre, donc on ne les choisit pas. C'est des gens avec qui on n'a pas le choix de partager un certain espace. Et ça, c'est quelque chose que, qui m'a marqué dans ce qu'il a dit. One thing that I found very interesting was when he made the distinction between the communities and the societies. And the communities being, um, could be virtual and, and um, were of a voluntary uh, nature because thanks to technology, whereas um, societies were made up of people who had to live together and had no choice in the matter. Ce qui est intéressant aussi dans, dans la conclusion du professeur Volton, c'est que pour lui, la, la communication, c'est la place de l'autre. Et non pas échanger un message, et non pas l'objet 
qui est l'information, ce que notre faculté, nous, on étudie, qui est le contenu, la, la sémantique, mais c'est vraiment la place de l'autre et non pas. Donc, on essaie de se faire comprendre par un. C'est pas essayer de se faire comprendre par l'autre, c'est plus essayer de donner un espace à l'autre dans notre propre monde. So, I found it interesting in his conclusion, when he was talking about communication, and he talked about the role or the place of the other person. Um, and, and it was, that was the important part. It wasn't the exchange or the communication going back and forth necessarily, but it was being understood by the other person. Évidemment, ce qu'il disait, c est, c est, ça revient avec le point de l'altérité, euh, qui est un, un problème important en communication, encore une fois la place de l'autre. Euh, il y a aussi quand il a fait la définition de, du mot communication, euh, on a le sens classique, qui voulait dire partager amour. Encore une fois, partager amour, c'est toujours avec quelqu'un d'autre, et jamais seul. Euh, Et puis maintenant, la nouvelle définition de la communication, c'est la transmission. Et ce qu'il rajoute aussi, l'interactivité. Et d'après lui, ce ne sont pas des synonymes communs au mot communication. So, uh, when, when uh, Professor Walton talked about uh, the otherness or alterité uh, in communication, he, he gave three definitions. The first one being sharing um, and love, with, and love with, with which implies being another person, and he talked about transmission and interactivity as well. Kind of. You can, you can okay. Um, actually, I need to reboot my brain a bit. Um, what I meant is that there's two definitions of uh, communication. Uh, the classical one is about sharing about the other person. And like I said, love and sharing can only be done with other people. Um, but transmission and interactivity, which are interactivity, which is an addition to this definition, are not synonymous to communication, uh, according to Professor. <coughs> La technique, c'est l'objet, et la technologie, c'est le discours sur les techniques. Que la réflexion critique, c'est l'objet de la technologie, et les techniques, ce sont les objets. Et in, in, French, in France, we make a distinction between technique and technology. So technique is the object, and the technology is the, is the means of the, the discourse, the discourse yeah, about it. Et à propos des utopies, que ce soit celle de McLuhan avant lui ou après lui, ce qui m'intéresse dans l'histoire, c'est le caractère récurrent des utopies. C'est-à-dire les, les techniques de l'imprimerie, au téléphone, à la radio, à la télévision, à l'ordinateur et aujourd'hui au réseau, sont successivement investies toujours des mêmes utopies. Et le mot pour moi utopie n'est pas que j'en Les hommes rêvent toujours qu'avec de nouvelles techniques, ils s'aimeront mieux. Et l'histoire des techniques est une histoire constante de désillusion. Parce que l'important, ce n'est pas la technique, évidemment. Ce sont les utopies des hommes. Et évidemment, la paix et le bonheur ne dépendent pas des techniques. <rire> either pre or post of McLuhan, um, things like the telephone, radio, television, computers, and now networks, um, all are, are predicated on the fact that at some point that it will lead to a type of u utopia. And actually with these technologies, we, we come to a disillusionment um, and not it's not leading to uh, utopia. La désillusion vient pas des techniques, elle vient des hommes. Et la désillusion vient des hommes, pas des techniques. La technique et l'information, c'est. Enfin, 
communication, c'est pas communication. Non. Mais il y a un pardon. Il y a un contresens incroyable. On parle de technique de communication, alors qu'en fait, la plupart du temps, il faudrait. Je refais ma phrase. Le... En fait, les techniques sont des techniques d'information. Elles transportent de l'information. Mais on rêve qu'elles fassent de la communication, donc on les appelle des techniques de communication. Et c'est là où il y a le site. So there's, there's a, a, a misunderstanding in that uh, when we talk about uh, te technology or techniques of, we're talking about techniques of information, but people would rather that it be techniques of communication. They, they dream about that, but that's not actually what it is. Donc en fait, technique de communication, c'est comme si le problème était résolu. Because when they talk about techniques of communication, they seem to think that the problem has no longer existed. So I guess I could say that uh, you have to know I, I know absolutely nothing about information and communication. I'm not from that field at all. Uh, not at all. Uh, I'm a clinical psychologist, and uh, basically tonight uh, uh, I'm here to express uh, some gratitude uh, for people that I've met in recent years. Uh, when she, I met her the first time, I said, what do you do? She said, uh, urban linguistic ecology. It like really hit me. It really did. I tell you why, because uh, I'm uh, Franco-Ontarien. Je suis Franco-Ontarien. Et puis, uh, I was born, uh, je suis né à Ottawa, à Ottawa, dans une famille francophone, dans un quartier italien. Alors, il parle italien, français. English, uh, in, a, in a province of 12 million, uh, 12 million uh, anglophones. Uh, I never lived in Quebec. I've been 30 years in Toronto. I was very lucky to be director of neuropsychological memory disorders at uh, uh, Baycrest, associated with uh, St. Group, so 23 years, where we catered a lot for the residents who were there, the Jewish community, and they, they, they changed my life. And there was not a day that I didn't speak French, by the way, because a lot of people, francophones in Quebec or Ontario or Toronto, don't know that there's a very large francophone Jewish community. You know, they don't know that. Well, I spoke French every day at Big Rest at Toronto. At Glendon, it's fantastic. So when I met with her, I said, that makes a lot of sense. I, I'm, I'm one hell of a hodgepodge. Not only that, I, when I came to Toronto in 1986, I, I moved into a Chinese neighborhood because French school was close by. I'm the only non-Asian on in my neighborhood, okay, Richmond Hill. Okay, now interesting there. Oh, my, my, my. So both of them, when I met the first day, they said, tu parles français? I said, yes. They started taking French courses. Why? I said, why, why, why? He said, good business. There's 20, I did the research, 20 million francophones in North America. 6.5 million Americans speak French. A lot of people don't know that. 3.5 million of them speak French at home. Francophiles. So when I speak to my colleagues uh, on the phone, telephone between uh, Toronto, where I work, I, I don't really work with Montreal as much, there's a triangle in my field. Uh, Chicago, uh, New York, uh, Boston, that tri and, and Toronto, okay, Toronto. And you know, a lot of people from the States come to Canada in our field. So, so basically, uh, I'm a bit of a hodgepodge, okay? Now, so what I've I know more about Dr. Bolton than I, I admitted to him. I, I've known him for quite a while. So that's where the gratitude comes. But So I, I'm going to speak a bit Franglais. Franglais is in the, in the world. Canada has a very unique uh, dialect. It's called Franglais. You can switch. Right? Don't we switch <laughs> here sometimes? Or, or especially the Anglophones from Montreal or, or, to, or in Ontario. I, I, I blend it. It's a... It's a, it's a C'est une institution euh, d'excellence euh, francophone et bilingue. Since 2012, francophone and bilingual. Bilinguals, way, way back, was people like me. We had no damn choice. So you, you, you have to be bilingual in Ontario. We didn't have to. Today, 70% of our students are francophiles, which is just a variation of French to me. To a pour moi. Like, I'm an anglophone to you, right? You're looking at me like as, as if I was an anglophone. That's fine with me. Je suis bilingue, okay? But, uh, so 75% are francophiles, and they really want to have, they come to Glenda for to have a French, an espace francophone to learn the second language. And the Quebecers, when they come, they speak English to us, francophiles, the francophones, 
because they come here to learn English. What a funny world we have. Right? <laughs> so, now, un mot franglais, un new, uh, so, we, so, un franglais, c'est, uh, si on pense, l'information, ce n'est pas la communication. Si vous pensez que l'information, c'est la communication, c'est une gaffe. So, c'est un mot, uh, uh, c'est, vous savez quoi, mais c'est, c'est du franglais gaffe. G-A-F-A. Google, okay. Apple, uh, F for uh, Facebook, and A for, what's the other one? Amazon, okay, right? So, yeah, for, so you got, so you got, so you got. He's interested. He wants to learn from you. In GAF, you know what GAF is? Oh, wait, it's better than GAF, so you want to know. Google, Apple, okay, and then Facebook, and Amazon. Okay, so when, I, when he says, when we say, that's what I understand, information is not communication, uh, it's a tune gap. So, uh, so basically, uh, an example of that, like, I, you know, in gap, what? Gap, in gap. So, TED lectures for me, the 12-minute TED, TED lectures, that's communication, not for me. Not for me. It, it, it's hard, you know, to get those 12 minutes You want to know everything you need to know about any area that you go to those TED lectures of 12 minutes. That's information. That is not communication, right? So there's a new phenomenon. We talk about slow food. Oh, I'd like to get back into slow thinking, right? Because la communication, elle est lente, elle est complexe. C'est une construction. C'est une, le mot communication, pour moi, hein, son étymologie, j'ai étudié le latin pendant 7 ans, euh, c'était action commune. Une action commune. Euh, c'était une, une euh, négociation. And in my book, so, so slow food, slow thing, we really need that. I'm a neuropsychologist. I, I work I, I, inside the brain, right? Some people believe that in the States. It's inside the brain. I say, you'll never understand the cortex if you don't put it in context. And I owe that to the French to understand the cortex in some context. Because I tell the Americans, look, if it's all in the brain, 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 I say, if it was all in the brain, if language was all in the brain, we'd all be French in Canada. It's too complicated. Of course, we have this machine that's capable of communication and language, but if language was all in the brain, you know? So, so basically, the cortex a context, that's my book. Don't tell anybody if I'm writing that book. It's a secret. So, 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 uh, uh, I work with the telencephalon. Telephone, television, telencephalon. That's memory is, uh, the telencephalon permits us to do memory and language, is to be able to, is the most amazing time traveling machine. You can go to the past and imagine possible futures. Only humans can do that. With thanks to the telencephalon, telencephalon which tel- helps you to teleport yourself in the past, in the future, to do what? To adapt, to better adapt to the here and now. If you're going to do that, you have to know how to communicate. You have to, you have to unplug. You have to unplug uh, uh, with the online. It on, can only be done offline. And as he was talking tonight, I had some flash flashes. Uh, the, 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 the photos éclair, right? the photos éclair, the flash. Uh, and and uh, you, you'll understand. Sure, sure, okay. Oh, that's good, that's good. So one flash was that We were, I was doing this research with, uh, uh, and you'll get it en français, franglais, because this story is about sex. It's about des femmes, women. They were all 85 plus, because I work in cognitive aging. So, femme, sex, and IBM. So, I mean, that's French, I huh? yeah. So, basically, en français, c'était un projet de recherche. Et puis, on avait lu gratuitement, free, by IBM, those computers, because older people, 85 plus, dealing with their husbands at home, because you know, there's after 85, there's five times more women than men, right? So mostly women, so hang in there, guys, okay? So, uh, 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 IBM, so, so basically, I was doing this free, and their technologists, their engineers, helped us to design, uh, it was very hard for those ladies to come to the hospitals, to institutions, so we decided to go to them, thanks to IBM, and they taught these ladies how to use that, and they did fantastic, okay? So basically, we were able to do forum using Skype. The forum, and then Skype, okay. So, and, and we had a control group, right? A really nice research with students. 
So basically, at the control group, and now within four sessions, four sessions, the ladies, we were doing this forum, I was there in the middle, and they were all around, you know, I could do eight at the time. Within four sessions, they blew our research because they were trying to negotiate to meet together these ladies. You know, so we're, we're going to your home using technology, and now you guys, because you guys can't come to the hospitals to come to our sessions, we did that for you, and now you want to organize a meeting in a coffee shop at, 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 at a Tim Horton? Why? Because they got to know each other, they want to meet, and they want to hug. They wanted to meet those ladies. That, that was my research, blown away, right? And uh, so basically, uh, uh, they called it the, the Café uh, Café 85, and they organized throughout their forum on their computers to get volunteer students to come and do some uh, some uh, respite at home so they could meet together. Okay, so and then they met at the coffee. They invited me, and they, they want to talk, you know, about about sex. Oh my God. I, I had a lot of hairs. I, got, I lost my hair that day. <laughs> 85 plus, they want to talk about sex. And I said, no, 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 I'm a neuropsychologist. I'm helping you with your husbands who have Alzheimer's, right? I said, no, no, Dean, the biggest sex organ, you don't understand, is between your two ears. And the second biggest sex organ is in your heart. Because, you know, sex is all about an intimacy, okay? Intimacy. If you take all of our lives and put them in a box and you shake it, what comes out is an intimacy. So, so basically, uh, 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 they, they were telling us that if you want to design your programs, technology is not going to do it. These people are, are, are lonely. They need home support services. It really messed, 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 messed us up uh, uh, very well. So that was a, an example. It were technology and communication. And I, we had to think it uh, differently and using technology. So, uh, so moi, ce qui m'interpelle le plus dans, 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 votre, dans votre démarche, c'est votre dimension anthropo anthropologique de la communication, the anth anthropological dimensions of communication. And so it was the same thing for Mr. McLuhan, you know. Uh, uh, so, so, uh, uh, and, and, and it's all this uh, interactive and, and dialectic approach that I find amazing. Uh, when I was, a, when I was a, a, a kid, I was reading Sartre, that was good, but then, then uh, that's where you come in. I was reading Sa, but I, I couldn't get his uh, hang up with uh, with the materialism, with the communism. So somebody told me there's an antidote, an antidote to Sa. Sa it was good with reading, except for this communist thing. So they said it's Raymond Aron, and that's how I got to know you, right? So uh, uh, je vois du Aron, and Monsieur Aron was a man who fly, by the way. He spent a lot of time in North America. And he was a, a, a man to be a, a man who was known to be a, a, a precursor of la mondialisation. So, uh, so, uh, uh, so, and, and, and uh, uh, I can also add that 1988, uh, there was something amazing that happened in La Rochelle in, in France, where my ancestors come from, La Rochelle, and they had this thing called the Francophonie. And within two years, so they would invite Francophones from all over the world to come and sing in La Rochelle. And I was there, it was amazing. Two years later, it was exported to Montreal and, 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 um, and uh, Belgium. And Francophones in Montreal think they've invented this, right? So it was exportation of, and 1988 is when Hermès came along. Hermès, you're here, okay? And uh, uh, it was amazing because CNSF is the National Research Council of, of France, and the way they write their volumes, is they have people from all types of different disciplines that look at different topics. And one in 1988 was on the Spanish and cognitive cognition. So in the 1990s, we talked about the cognitive revolution. They were talking about it then. They were talking about it then. But uh, the Anglophones in, 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 in Toronto would say, science is English. What about those French people, right? What's it all about? So basically, uh, uh, this is a big thank you to you. and. Uh, I'm not a specialist in in, in, in communication, in uh, uh, information and, and communication, but I did understand uh, the importance of of, of l'altérité, l'autre, and you know the importance.
It's going to match the speed of my English to the speed of your French, but that would not be fair. Um, and I also, uh, Professor Lodon, um, apologize for speaking to you um, in English. I have some command of French, uh, but mostly it's the product of an English education um, where they are remarkably anal in their educational world when I was younger, um, that you had to speak French perfectly. Um, and if you did not speak it perfectly, you suffered physical harm. That actually <laughs> means that I'm always, when I make a mistake in French, I'm always waiting, you know, for the pain to come, because <laughs> my French friends don't give me pain, thank goodness. I wanted to just suggest a, a, that, that there were one thing, I love the idea of, of slow thinking, because um, whenever I have the privilege to listen to uh, thoughtful academics from other um, domains or other um, countries. Uh, I need a lot of time to try and absorb what they've said and to try and, and you know, to, it percolates through. I'm not sure how much um, I end up understanding. I'm not sure how valuable my thoughts are after that slow percolation. But it's, it's not something where I, I try not to immediately try and understand in an odd sort of way, because if I try and immediately understand, I'm taking the English words um, and my understanding of those English words and not really understanding it's somebody who, even if they are speaking English, it's not their uh, native language, or if they're being translated, even more um, sort of Baroque relationships exist between the information and the community. There were a couple of things I wanted, sort of coming out of my thinking, to sort of um, hopefully have you think about. One of the one of them has to do with the importance of forgetting. Um, and if one looks at Ireland, if one looks at um, uh, the Bosnian War, if you look at most of the world conflicts and you ask them why. It's not just they don't understand us or we see the world a different way. It's the Battle of the Boyne in 1762. It's um, the conversion or the attempted conversion of um, uh, to Catholicism in the 13th century in parts of Europe and so on. So there, there is, to me, there's an interesting question in terms of human history about the importance of forgetting, but also within the institutions we build, um, and particularly through the technology. Because some of my research is, I, I, in some of my research, I'm concerned with the fact that the technology increasingly uh, <coughs> embeds within organizations and institutions um, uh, a, a way of seeing the world, a way of understanding, and makes it extremely difficult change. That also led me to think that, um, having made a comment about the Library in Alexandria, perhaps it was a good thing the Library in Alexandria, but that should say this in this world. But it's, it's interesting the reaction to, the, 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 and I'm thinking along those lines, two things that happened um, to what survived the Library of Alexandria. And it's interesting because I think it runs counter to the arrogance of the Western tradition, in the sense that the Greek texts that survived the Library of Alexandria um, were translated into Arabic. And then, of course, they came in through the Middle Ages to the European tradition. What seems to be interesting, and I, I was embarrassed because I'd done some study in one of my master's degrees of 12th century Islamic science. I was embarrassed because I was talking to somebody and suddenly realized they knew far more about it than I did, which was not difficult, um, and far more about the recent scholarship. But 
The interesting thing about the Arabic translations, it turns out that they weren't just simply, or they, indeed they weren't just simply translating it. Um, there is good evidence that over a period of about 150 years, they were questioning the Greek science, and they were annotating it and so on. And what's interesting is, compare that to what, what seems to have happened, and again, I'm writing history, simply to what happened in the Middle Ages. Because there was almost a slavish acceptance. There wasn't a lot of questioning. This is what, you know, this is what it is. And that's interesting. And then, of course, we say, of course, in the end, we came to the scientific method and so on. But it's interesting whether sort of that, that we didn't necessarily use the knowledge and sort of develop and absorb the knowledge in the same way as previously. Um, and as a very last point, one of the things I delight in, yes, the Americans seem to dominate technologies. You mentioned radio. The Americans just sure hell don't dominate radio anymore. A, they'd like to close down NPR anyway. I mean, that's pure. But if you look at uh, innovation in radio, some of it, and some small amount is taking place in the States, but there's a lot of innovation going on around the world. Um, I, of course, mainly know of the English speaking and certainly my own students, interesting enough, for party to a number of innovations going on at CBC. And as long as Stephen Harper doesn't get his way and close everything down, we will continue to have some innovation in radio and perhaps some of the other media it will percolate there. That I've said more than enough. So thank you very much for giving me many things to slow think about. <laughs>